and welcome to today's episode of The Pagan Parlor. Today is Friday, November 12, 2021, and I am your host, Maximilian Pensord, but you can call me Max. Here in this podcast, we will explore a variety of things related to paganism. At this point, I would like to give a notice and reminder that paganism is a broad term that envelops many different pantheons and belief systems, and as such, this podcast will be focused on paganism as a whole and not on any specific branch of it. Each episode contains a short lesson on a stone or metal, a story, myth, or legend, and a segment I like to call Keeping Up with the Christians, which you will hopefully find amusing as well as informative on what the Christians are up to lately. Now, since we are all busy people, we'll jump straight in with a quick ritual. This ritual is intended to join the energies of the listeners in with the energies of the host, as well as the same in reverse, as well as some basic protections against the ill intentions of others. I will now light the candle, and as I do so, I invite all beings of good energy and good intent into the ritual space. Humans and gods and goddesses alike, spirits and the fae, Come and join together in good nature, add to play. Come old, come young, come scarred and burned, it matters not, there's a lesson to be learned. Come in good faith, and you will be safe, but come with ill intent, and your mind shall get bent. Bring us together in storms and good weather, keep us from pain and from those who are sane. For the harm of none and the good of many, we call to the gods, and they are many. Blessed are we, so mote it be. This week's lesson uses information that comes from occultworld.com and wikipedia.org. This week, we are learning about iron. Iron is a metal which mostly occurs as an ore in the Earth's crust. It has a melting point of almost 2800 degrees Fahrenheit and is one of the primary components used to make steel. This metal has been used for tools since around 1200 BCE. In India, iron is used to repel evil spirits. In Ireland, it's used to repel mischievous fairies. In ancient Greece and Rome, it was forbidden to bring it into temples or for it to be used by their priests. The Saxons would not put iron rune wands into their cemeteries because they did not want to drive away their ancestor spirits, and it has been used to create amulets to protect against the spells of dark witches. Generally speaking, across all cultures of the world, iron has been seen as a metal of protection. It can be used in spells to ward off curses and hexes, in making charms to prevent nightmares, or generally for anything related to defending against negative energy and spirits. Also, remember not to leave your iron tools in water or in areas of high humidity where they will begin to rust. If you cut yourself on a rusty piece of iron, you become at risk for tetanus, and if you do not get medical treatment, it can kill you. So don't be a dumbass and die because you didn't care for your tools properly or see a doctor when needed. Next, we have our Pagan Promotion section. Herein, I will highlight one person of interest, celebrity, or pagan-owned business per week. This week, we are taking a look at a pagan-owned business in the Las Vegas Valley of Nevada. Sticks and Stones is located at 3528 South Maryland Parkway, Suite 102, Las Vegas, Nevada, inside the Boulevard Mall. They carry a variety of gemstones, crystals, smudge sticks, candles, oils, and more, as well as offering basic instructions on how to use their products, both in the store and online on their website. Wasn't able to find out how long they've been in business, but a five-star rating review on uh, Yelp cannot be ignored with how fast people are to give low scores to rude people. So if you live in the area and need witchcraft supplies, give them a visit. The next section is on stories, myths, and legends. In this portion of the podcast, I will retell a legend, myth, or story related to the gods, magic, or anything else I feel to be paganism related. This week's story comes from the Filipino tradition and can be found in its full version at gutenberg.org from within the book titled Philippine Folk Tales by Mabel Cook Cole. The story is about the son of a spirit who went on to commit many terrible deeds and killed many people before they finally found a way to put an end to his reign of terror. The Story of Cyan In the dark depths of the forest, where people rarely went, there lived a wizened old spirit the size of a human, 
with wings and their toes on the backs of their feet and with their fingers pointing backwards towards their wrist. Their skin was like toughened hide, and she was indeed horrible to look at. As it happened, <clears throat> she had a son, whose name was Cyan. Cyan was as handsome as his mother was ugly, and he often sought out fights because he did not know fear. While traveling around to look for people to fight, he encountered many beautiful women and wanted to pick one for marriage. Upon hearing one who was more beautiful than all the others, he decided that this one would be his wife. The woman he had chosen, her name was Danapan, and she was very shy. When she heard that Cyan was coming, and what he had intended for her, she hid behind her door and sent her servant out instead. Cyan was fooled by Danapan's ruse, and instead carries off her servant, Lei, to marry. He built a home, and they had a baby. Everything was good in his life, until one day he overheard her singing to her baby of the deception that they had performed on him. Cyan became angry, and the next day he ordered her to bring him his lunch in the field, as he would be too busy plowing to return for it. He also told her that she should bring the baby with her. After this, he went on his way to the field for wor to work, but he took the time to cut the support ropes from the bridge on his way. Later that day, Lei and her baby fell into the river and drowned. Seeing that his wife and child were dead, Cyan was pleased with the return of his freedom. He then took up his spear and his shield and his head axe, and he went back to the village where Danapan lived, and proceeded to slaughter everyone he saw. Danapan saw what he was doing, and ran out distraught, begging him to stop killing her people. When he saw how beautiful she was, he agreed to stop, and then told her to bring him some betel nuts, which he then chewed and spat the juices upon the corpses. After a few minutes, they began to stir and return to life, and Cyan married Danapan and took her back to his home that he had built. A while later, the people of Magosang were in trouble because a spirit that looked like a man was killing people from the village in equal proportion to the amount of deer that their hunters killed for food. Whenever the people went out to hunt, the spirit Komau would approach the hunters as they skinned their deer and ask them how many they had caught before responding he had caught the same number and leaving, only for the hunters to find that that number of people from their village had been slain upon their return. The people begged Cyan for help, and so he gave it. He hid while the people hunted, and then he jumped out and attacked and killed the spirit Kamau while he spoke with the other hunters. When the spirit Kabonian, who was next in importance to Kadaklan, the great spirit, saw what Cyan had done in the killing of Kamau. He said to Cyan that the next day the two of them would fight. When the next day came, Kabonayan began to fight with Cyan, but found that neither could triumph over the other, and it was a great shock to a spirit as great as Kabonayan. After their fighting resulted in a draw, Kabonayan suggested that they team up together in order to fight all the men of the nearby villages. Cyan, liking to fight, also liked this idea, and so they teamed up and started to kill people immediately. Many people were killed, and yet nobody could ever capture them, because nobody knew that one of them was the spirit Kabonian, and the second uh, spirit Kabonian, who was second only to Kadaklan, or that the other was the great and terrible spirit known as an Alan. When surrounded by water, Cyan would turn into a fish, and if he was trapped in a town, he would become a chicken and hide under a chicken coop. As a result of his transformative magics, he escaped many times. Finally, after they had killed a great many people, the people decided to watch what happened, and they saw Cyan's transformations. The next night, the villagers placed fish traps underneath the chicken coops throughout their village. And when Cyan went under a chicken coop to escape, he was trapped and killed at last. That was the story of Cyan. I would like to take a moment and apologize if I horribly botched the pronunciations on anything. As a native English speaker, some sounds are difficult to make, even more so without an example of how it is supposed to sound.
Now let's move on to the next segment, which I like to call Keeping Up with the Christians. In this segment, I like to take a look at what the Christians are doing lately and dissect it from a non-Christian's point of view. Part of this is just a report on their goings-on, and part of this is just making fun of them, so I hope you enjoy it. This week, a right-wing Christian church in Idaho and its pastor have been leading protests encouraging civil disobedience and generally have been a pain for those trying to implement coronavirus public health measures in Idaho. Despite taking the government COVID-19 bailout money, they are arguing against mask mandates and making the claim that this is all just the ruling elites trying to spark unrest in the general population. The full article was written by Jason Wilson and is available at theguardian.com. Additionally, Christians in Jerusalem are claiming that there is a growing amount of discrimination against Christians within the area, from Palestinian Muslims and other non-Christian parties. They report feeling threatened and abused on religious grounds. Now, the full article is available at christiantoday.com and was written by Julian Mann. With that out of the way, how stupid do you have to be to think that people are going to be nice to you in a place you have no business being? Across history, two religious groups have dominated the area, Jews and Muslims. Now, whenever Christians think that they have some right to the land that their God supposedly came from, despite all the people that are already living there, they mount up a holy crusade, so I'm just not feeling much sympathy or empathy. Finally, Christians in Canada and the United States are crying because of the continued moves to outlaw Christian counseling. The article on WNG.org, written by Stephen Wedgworth, goes on to cry about how men and women were made to be uh, to become a single whole flesh, and how man and woman uh, together is right, whereas man and man together, or woman and woman together in love, is a sin, as well as discussing how if a married couple gets divorced and then remarry, both of them are guilty of cheating on each other. Now, you might be wondering, why outlaw Christian counseling? What's so bad about pastors and, rever re pastors and reverends giving life advice to the people within their churches? The thing is, these religious groups tell people that any member of the LGBTQ community is living in sin. The ban against Christian counseling is in reality a ban against religious conversion therapy where a preacher tells a trans woman or a man that they are listening to the devil for wanting to be themselves, or that a teenage couple who is of the same sex, that they are created in the image of their God, but they are also created wanting to do things that send them to hell. So these bans are currently in place and active for 21 out of the 50 not-so-United States of America. Keep up the good fight and understand that the only restrictions that should be placed on love are consent and age. Everyone involved must consent, and either nobody or everybody involved should be over the age of majority within their country. Well, that's it for Keeping Up With The Christians today. Tune in next week and find out the latest Christian drama. Now, as I've mentioned before, I would like to do a section on audience questions where I spend a few moments and address questions that any of you may have on uh, paganism, crystals, spells, herbs, really just anything that you guys may have for me. So, this is now the third episode. Not a single person has sent anything into the email I set up for this. If you have any questions, want to leave a comment or suggestions or content suggestions or even just send me death threats because you're a butthurt Christian and you can't stand to hear me talking smack about your religion, please feel free to send them all to me at paganparlor1313 at gmail.com. That's all I have for today. Thank you for tuning in to The Pagan Parlor. Again, any questions, comments, suggestions, or death threats can be sent to paganparlor1313 at gmail.com. The whole of the law shall be do as thou wilt, but harm none. Blessed be, and don't forget to blow out your candles. <laughs>